So welcome everyone um, to this panel, which is titled 2025, Welcome to the Future, powered by NFTs. Um, now I think everyone here will be familiar with NFTs and how they relate to digital assets, um, which are pri primarily objects or things, by which I mean art, pictures, collectibles, um, autographs, that kind of thing. But this panel, in this panel, we're going to examine how NFTs might and do um, incorporate experiences into those assets and how NFTs and DAOs, for those who don't know, decentralized autonomous organizations are funding all kinds of creative work, um, including challenging experimental projects that no longer fit within the old museum structures and commercial art markets. Um, there'll be a 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end. So if anyone has any questions, please pitch in. We'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. Um, but before that, I'd like to introduce my panelists. Um, next to me here, I have Rose Lejeune. She is a curator and consultant with particular expertise in working with artists whose practices have strong multidisciplinary, performative, digital, or public and social elements. Um, among other curatorial and teaching roles, she is the director of Performance Exchange, which is a UK-wide project uh, working to embed performance within collections. And she's also the curator, curator of Delphina Foundation's Collecting as Practice program. Um, you will have noticed we have Seth Goldstein, who is joining us um, from Los Angeles at about 2.30 in the morning. So we appreciate that, Seth. Thank you. Seth is a founding member of Bright Moments, which is a California-based NFT gallery and DAO that opened its physical doors in May 2021. And they also have a booth here in the new digital gallery section at Art Dubai. Uh, Seth is also an early internet pioneer and artist. So thank you, Seth. We appreciate your presence. Um, and last but not least, we have Keith Cassaday, who is a former investment banker. Uh, he joined Bright Moments to focus on the generative art market, DAO tokenomics, and community building in the Web3 economy. So I'd like to start by asking Seth, I think, um, a, to, to sort of explain a bit about um, the background to Bright Moments. You, your, your gallery specialises in live NFT minting experiences. Now, to my mind, minting equates to kind of uploading a digital um, artwork to a marketplace. I, I'm really interested to know how you make an event and an, and a, and an experience out of, of the minting process. Uh, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Nice to see everybody, sort of. Um, I think one of our, our taglines, I see my friend Jonathan in the audience as well. Um, one of our, I guess our, our tagline for Bright Moments is where art is born. And um, it's a very intentional use of the word born because we think about NFTs as a new art form. Um, it's a new mechanism for coordination, not just consumption. And um, I think a lot of people, when you talk about NFTs now, it's seen as a, a simple flat mode of expression. You know, they think about, you know, we, we call it like slinging JPEGs, people trading JPEGs back and forth. There's nothing really artistic about it. Um, and I think in our case at Bright Moments, we have a really great origin story for how we started in Venice Beach uh, about a year ago, which was um, we were all coming out of the quarantine. Um, we were all, all of us in, in different stripes and, and shapes and forms were coming out of coffee every morning underneath a Venice sign at a coffee shop called Minotti's. And um, it was really the spring of NFTs that were really just starting to bloom for the second time. The first time was back in 2016, 2017 with Crypto Kitties and Crypto Punks. And that was a, a moment in time that got eclipsed by um, the shattering of the ICO bubble. Um, but then about a year ago or a year and a half ago, we started to see the medium kind of bubble up again. Um, and we saw pl found platforms like Foundation and, and Super Rare um, come of being. and. Um, so what happens, a lot of us decided um, out of quarantine to start an art gallery. And we started an art gallery called Bright Moments uh, on Windward Ave in Venice Beach. And it was simply a brick wall of about 30 or 40 feet with three screens hung on it where we were going to show NFTs maybe once a week at nighttime. 
And our first show was with Jeff Davis, uh, who happens to be the co-founder and co-creative officer, or the creative officer for Artblocks. And Jeff is a generative artist. And um, we showed nine of his portals uh, last June in his show. Um, and we were worried about how to bring people to the gallery to get foot traffic. So we knew we could have people show up for an event at night, but we didn't know how we were going to bring people during the daytime. And so we had an ingenious idea, which was to give away NFTs during the afternoon. And inspired by CryptoPunks, we came up with a collection called Crypto Venetians. And so every afternoon around three o'clock, we would give away NFTs um, to people that would come to the gallery and you could only mint them. And this is where we get to your question. You could only mint them if you were there live physically in person. Right. And so that's where this art form, these NFTs were born. They were born physically by individuals coming to the gallery one by one. And you could only mint once. And this was against the backdrop and, and still against the backdrop of minting NFTs, mostly at home, mostly alone behind your screen. You mint 10 NFTs, you keep two, you sell eight. It's like a commodity. There's nothing really personal about it. And I think what was unique about us and what really um, is our true north as a gallery is this idea that the act of minting an NFT itself can be something deeply meaningful and creative. Um, and, and Keith will tell you because you know, he, he's, he was there and, and helped facilitate this. Um, but the show that we had, for example, in the fall in New York City with Tyler Hobbs, got to the point where we minted 100 NFTs over four nights, uh, 25 a night. Um, and this was Tyler Hobbs' first show after Fidenza. Um, and these artworks were minted and experienced at the same time as the artist himself was seeing them, right? So you have this opportunity, this moment where the, the viewer and the creator are experiencing the art for the first time together. And that's super unique and interesting um, and really enables the, the collector and the viewer to attach more deeply to the artwork because it's being, on some level, co-created on the blockchain. Right. I wanted to ask you, Keith, about this, this, this specific show. It was called Incomplete Control by Tyler Hobbs, as Seth has just mentioned. And it pre-sold $10 million worth of NFTs even before the art was made, which kind of blows my mind slightly. Um, but can you just sort of talk us through that evening in New York? You had, am I right in thinking, 100 people, collectors, crypto right. investors in, in the gallery, and they were led away to be part of the minting process? So the, so the process, we, the way we create our live, so we have, first we have our, let's go back for a few slides. We have our own class of NFT as, as Bright Moments DAO. These are the crypto citizens. So we started in Venice, we have crypto Venetians. In New York, we have crypto New Yorkers. In Berlin in April, we'll be having crypto Berliners. And in July in London, we'll have crypto Londoners. And the way we go forward in each city is we have a thousand of these, and these are our own NFT. And if you hold one of these NFTs, you're part of our DAO, which is part of our organization. Um, and what's, what's unique about that is every NFT has a, you know, you can vote on certain proposals, and there's certain rights that are attached to those NFTs. So that's, that's the core NFT behind Bright Moments. But in addition, we have live events where we host artists, and we bring artists together with their collectors in our gallery spaces, as Seth was mentioning. And so in New York, we had two shows in our New York gallery. First was Reflections by Jeff Davis, and the one we're talking about now is Incomplete Control by Tyler Hobbs. And the way we perform these events is we pre-sell tickets uh, as in the form of an NFT. And so you have to hold an NFT to come to the event. And at that time, you exchange your NFT, and then the minting of this artwork happens. And this art happens to be an art blocks type project, which means the art is stored in code. It's, it's, this is code-based art. The artist writes code, it's an algorithm, it's uploaded to the blockchain, and when you mint, which means like you create or you basically stamp that transaction, it feeds in a randomized hash, and that hash goes into the art code and produces a unique piece. Only, there's only one type of piece, and the code can have thousands, hundreds of thousands of possible variations, outputs, randomization, but in terms of incomplete control, there's only 100 that will ever exist. There's only 100 incomplete controls. You can take that code and run new outputs, but the chain, the blockchain, will tell you which were the true, are the true 100 incomplete controls, who currently holds them, who minted it, if it ever sold, 
it's all logged on the chain. And so the blockchain is a very efficient means of provenance and transferring and way to track you know, assets, what's in everyone's wallet, who's collecting what. And so in New York, uh, across four nights, we minted 25 of these a night with their collectors, Tyler Hobb. We, uh, we sold you know, without any sample of the artwork, just based on Tyler Hobb's previous work, Fidenza. Uh, we pre-sold the, the NFTs. And we, the way we do it is we ran a Dutch auction a declining Dutch, au Dutch auction uh, highest, to, you know, until the, we start the price high and it declines by certain intervals until the piece sells out. And that provides price discovery. Um, and it also provides, yeah, you know, anybody, anybody can purchase it if they, you know, if they're willing to you know, pay the right market price. And so that's, um, that's kind of the market aspect. And coming from a financial background, that's obviously what, uh, what, where my skills lie. Uh, I'm also intrigued that the fact that the, 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 the art is being generated simultaneously by the collector yeah. and the artist. It's the first time the artist yeah. sees the sort of realization of the code, am I right? Yes, in, exactly. In so the artist knows what the code is capable of, but they don't know what the final outputs of the code will be when it's finally minted. And when the minting happens and the artist and the collector are viewing the work for the same time, it's, that's that magical experience that you know, will we'll last forever. Uh, and it creates a unique bond, it creates unique communities. There are collectors that came together just to, they created a DAO, an organization, just to come and collect incomplete controls. And so this DAO actually holds nine of the 100 incomplete controls. Total strangers came together on the internet, pooled resources, they pooled Ethereum, they pooled ETH to, to acquire, and now they hold, and, uh, they hold a bunch of uh, incomplete controls. They're Tyler Hobbs, they're art blocks, and they're art enthusiasts. And, um, it's, you know, the communities are very strong. Well, we will come to DAOs a bit later on, but I did, before we bring Rose into the conversation, just wanted to touch on one, one other project which you, 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 you organized called Rituals. And this was the first in real life generative art minting event which took place over three days for 50 continuous hours in Los Angeles. <laughs> Sounds a bit like a Marina Abramovich <laughs> endurance um, performance. Yes. Um, similar in, in length. Um, the, the term rituals obviously has sort of sacred or spiritual connotations and we sort of were talking yesterday, we were sort of slightly joking that it sounds a bit cultish, you know, you're sort of indoctrinated into this cult, uh, which is very different and very opposite to the sort of very transactional element of NFTs that we're used to, this sort of fast trading. I just wondered, Seth or Keith or both of you, you know, what was the thinking behind the rituals project and how did visitors respond to that minting event? I mean, you had gong baths and incense, didn't you, going, you know, you made this sort of very intense experience. Rituals was a marathon. Uh, this was basically our first IRL generative art minting project that was continuous for 50 hours straight. People arrived, again, it was a pre-ticketed event. Collectors arrived on a Thursday night in Los Angeles. We had an opening party, great food. And then about 15 minutes, uh, there were 15 minute minting blocks that ran continuously for the next three days until Sunday. Sunday, I guess it was you know, two, three and a half days until Sunday evening, um, all through the night, you know, two, three, four, five a.m., all through the day. We were rotating ships of minters, people would come they would exchange their NFT, they would mint this piece, and then they would have a specific unique reveal. And then in this case, the reveal was a big screen hanging in a room with a reclining chair. This piece is an audio visual piece, and that's where the ritual aspect comes in. It has very meditative, generative art music, and this artwork will not be the same if it ran continuously for nine and a half million years. It was by, it's by Aaron Penne and Justin Beretta, and it's a, it's a, it was a collaboration between an art blocks artist and a, 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 a musician from the Glitch Mob. Uh, and so we, as Bright Moments, that was kind of our proving ground in terms of this is an event that we can run, people will come to it, people go away taking this work and the experience away, and they meet the artist, and they meet the community, and they have this very special, unique experience. Uh, Seth, I don't know if you have anything else to add to the, to the rituals. We got Seth's audio. Oh, we've lost it. Right. Sorry, I was it's muted. It was, it was very much inspired by the avant-garde and by Marina Abramovich, and um, way back when I was a, uh, I used to work for Robert Wilson as an archivist and, and Bob did Einstein on the Beach with Philip Glass in 1976, which was an enormously long opera at the Brooklyn Academy of Music and at the Met, um, and, and Fluxus and Happenings and Alan Capro and the performance art of the seventies was all about stretching our perceptions. Um, and I think that was the idea going into rituals, which is how do we take a medium that is so um, technical and so transactional 
and at the same time um, stretch our perceptions um, and disorient ourselves as people, as human beings around this new technology to create something interesting. And so the, the marathon started on a Friday night with dinner um, by um, Travis Lett, who's an uh, acclaimed chef, a chef at Justa and Jelena in Venice Beach and part of our Dow. And it, um, it ended with dinner um, Sunday at sunset, 50 hours later. And the idea was that these people um, who had never met each other and maybe they had met online, um, coming together to each have an experience for 15 minutes, minting a piece of work intimately uh, on their own or with a loved one, uh, surrounded by speakers with a giant screen in the sky above them. Um, and it was um, ambient generative music um, and, and super, you know, sort of trippy psychedelic visuals. Uh, and they would have their 15 minutes um, and then someone else would come in. And so there were 200 IRL only mints. And at the end of the weekend, everyone had dinner together uh, to, to, to experience together what they had experienced together, you know, individually in the past. And so we blended the sort of extreme um, endurance event physically with these transactional objects to, I think, create something um, as we felt it, that was more grounded, um, that wasn't transactional, that wasn't a commodity, uh, that balanced, I think, um, some of the, you know, aspects of this medium that are financialized with, I think, some aspects of this medium that are more spiritual and more grounded um, psychologically. So what are we right in thinking? So just to, to break it down, um, the NFT is your ticket. It's the, the experience. It's your ticket to the experience. And it is also sort of the token, the object you take away as a memory, so to speak, of that experience. You, you have an NFT, which is our token, to, like, a ticket to come to the event, and you exchange that for a, you exchange that, and then you create the actual artwork as a separate NFT. So there are two NFTs. There we're two. using, yeah, we're using NFTs as a form of ticketing, and you're exchanging that for an NFT artwork. So there are two, yeah, there are two separate NFTs, but NFTs are a broad term, which you can use for many things. Um, it's a token on the chain that basically proves ownership of something. Sure. Um, and it could be tied to an artwork, it could be tied to an image, it can just be, it's basically just, you know, it's, it's a number. Uh, and in this case, it's code, and the code of rituals, the code of incomplete control, the code of reflections, as long as the Ethereum blockchain exists, you'll be able to recreate this artwork. And so it'll be, you know, forever in that regard. I'd like to bring Rose in here. So Rose, I mean, you've obviously been in, involved in the traditional art world, and it's quite funny to speak about performance as traditional because it's, it's, it's here, you know, until now, really seen as, being seen as quite peripheral, perhaps, or, or, or fringe. Um, how does what we've been hearing um, relate to what's happening in the broader museum ecology? That's a, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, actually, I, to, to, to answer that is also to start with kind of riffing off what Seth was just saying a minute ago, which is that one of the things that strikes me is about how some of this conversation feels like it's about a very new technology and something that is has has kind of a real kind of potential in terms of certain kinds of transparency and certain kinds of supporting artists' practice in different ways. And some of it riffs off yeah, like traditional performance art in terms of like, I mean, the happenings kind of moment, which Seth kind of mentioned was something that was going through my mind quite a lot as you were talking about it. You know, it's, it's, it's 1950s New York. It's, it's a group of people coming together to experience something that is explicitly set up as being something that you are going to make and co-create. And, but also there's a theatre involved in it that means that the artist is in fact kind of controlling the environment in a way. And I think like what we've seen, the other bit of that is that a lot of what this conversation reminded me of in terms of when you're talking about the rituals is like, that well, sounds quite like an art fair. Like mm. it sounds quite like any kind of event where a group of people who have a similar interest and a similar passion come together to experience that, that those objects as a way of kind of communicating with each other and as a way of engaging with each other as much as about the specificity of that as a kind of thing. So, so that's sort of what we're all doing here, right? Half of us have flown 
halfway around the world for three days to eat really nice food, to have a drink, to see people that, you've, that you're friends with, to meet new people, to talk about things that you have in common with each other, and to, some of them, to buy and to own objects at the end of it. And so, and so it's both this kind of set of ritualized experiences that are quite common to us mm. and also kind of matching that, I think very much as Seth was saying, with a kind of new technology that, that then has other kinds of applications. Mm. Um, I think the other thing that, that for me is, is kind of running through some of this in terms of the work that I'm doing a bit more, which is about supporting kind of museums to think about how to expand their collections is, is in terms of things like traditional digital art. <laughs> I'm quite upset that's become a thing. Um, and film and video and performance is also the way in which, you know, we're, we're, we're experiencing a moment where, where as the, econ the broader economic kind of context that artists are making is changing, which is to say, like, if you think, if you go back to the happenings moment, you've basically got, like, a derelict city. New York is, like, empty. London is, at that moment, like, bombed out. Like, places you can squat, you can just find an empty building and make a show. You can, in the British context, like go on the dole, maybe that's a bit later, but you know, like you can live and work and make in the city without worrying too much about making money. Mm. And that's just not true for artists anymore. So also in that sense, when you're thinking about how to support these kinds of practices, you also have to start including different kind of economic foundations to, to help that happen in. And for me, that, again, is where this becomes really kind of interesting, is how, how it also presents ways of supporting the production and the distribution of practices that have traditionally been very anti-commercial and very non-commercial in, in ways that exactly that hold the integrity of the work. So what are the challenges, would you say, <laughs> in collecting performance art? I mean, it's a bit of a big one, but if you could break that down for us. I think, I mean, it's interesting because in the, in the, certainly in the British context, um, like I say, a lot of artists in the sort of, I don't know, 50s, 60s, probably even like my generation of people that went to art school in like the, the turn of this century, I think you could argue probably until 2008 is a, that kind of moment. Like things like performance and even some kinds of film and video, which were kind of distributed very widely, you know, that anti-commercial kind of um, viewpoint was really important to them. That was a political stance to not be part of the art market, to not be thinking about art in terms of its economic value, to only think about art in terms of politics and social and cultural value, and to really reject that kind of, like... Um, and so, so in some ways, there's still, like, certain resistance to that idea of how things like performance art come into the market because it's like the last bastion of something that, that politically is really important. Um, but I think more practically, some of the challenges are also that, again, like in the European context, a lot of our museums are 150 years old. Right. And so they're collecting structures, their they're, you know, storage, their conservation structures, the way that the people who hold those collections, think about those collections is in terms of like very, very object-based practice. So paintings on racks, sculptures in boxes, these things that, that, that need to be looked after and kept, like you, your job is to keep it the same as it's always been. And what we're talking about here is things that are mutable and change and experiential. And so in a really practical way, that's also just like, how do you, how do you start to catalog those things? How do you look after those things? How do you hold on to an integrity of an idea over a period of time when it's changing? Um, and so, so, for example, like the work that I do with this project Performance Exchange, which is a programme of performances that happen over commercial galleries in London, and then for each of the performances, we write like an acquisitions document so that rather than just having interpretation of that artwork or, or an explanation of that artwork, you have a piece of kind of text that suggests ways that it could enter into a collection. And that can include copyright and IP and all of those kind of things, but it also has to include 
for example, how you want performers to be treated, how, you, how much rehearsal time they're going to need, how, what kind of space requirements they're going to have, like scripts, props, like human elements as well as material elements. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be different for every single one. You can't kind of like just be like, well, it's, you put it in a box and you put it on a rack. And, and so I think that's really challenging for structures that are kind of set up in quite kind of rigid kind of frameworks. Um, so, yeah, does that? No, absolutely. And to my mind, this is where, and in my, I'm trying to sort of bridge these two worlds. You're from a very traditional art world and we're from, you know, from the Dow tokenomics end. And really, I'm sort of trying to think how these applications might apply mm. to the traditional mm. art world. And smart contracts is something which I think are very interesting um, and for those who don't know um, you know uh, nfts are embedded in smart contracts um, a smart contract is a self executing contract with the terms of engagement between the buyer and seller being directly written into lines of code so they're automatically generated um, during the minting process and just listening to what you're talking there about leaving very specific sets of instructions say if a performer dies or they want their work to be performed by someone else Sounds the, like you're leaving an algorithm, like your, your, yeah. Yeah, your instructions. And I think, yeah. again, it's really interesting because it does, like, like, in some ways, for me, the smart contract is, like, the, the, the new application of conceptual art practice, kind of, you know, in terms of, like, things like, like Sol Lewitt, for example. Like, I think we were talking yesterday and we were talking, it's like, and you were saying, well, there's a certificate and you have to have the certificate in order to prove that the work is yours and, and that gives you the right to do it. And it's like, well, so a Sol Lewitt drawing, wall drawing, like, anybody can draw a circle on a wall and that looks like a Sol Lewitt, but unless you have the piece of paper that proves yeah. that that is It's a an instruction set. Exactly. And the sort of Seth Siegler, um, Bartis Resites. Yeah. Right, same. I think there's, um, I think, Rose, what you really pick up on, which I think is super helpful, and I hadn't really thought of it this way, is that um, there's a history of art that is performative, but we've never had a mechanism to um, track that. It's always been, um, there's an art object, and it's physical, and you can buy it and hold it and collect it, or you're an audience at a happening, and it never happened. Right. And I think with these new forms and I think, you know, I think it was there's a lineage of conceptual art that probably goes way back further than Eve Klein. But from Eve Klein to Saul LeWitt Instructables, um, that there is uh, a framework now of tokenization where um, you can have just been there and, and leave a trace that you don't have to take the work home with you to be a collector. Whereas in the past, you had to have some object to prove that it was your art and that being there and participating and engaging in a happening was never enough because there were no NFTs to hold in your Ethereum wallet when you left the building. But now you can. Mm. And that's really powerful. And I think what it's doing is it's, it's rendering um, a, a kind of artistic engagement that was always there, but we never had a language for and I think that's the most exciting aspect of NFT art in my mind is not that, you know, it's a, it looks like a Blade Runner on the screen. That's the least interesting part of it. The most interesting is the way we can tokenize uh, the fact that we were there, that we were participants um, and that we're connected uh, through that happening on chain forever. And I, I mean, just to exact to kind of maybe finish that thought as well for me what's really important about that is is that idea of multidisciplinarity in art history so so i think increasingly what you see now is artists who don't define themselves by one medium they see them they, they have ideas and those ideas can articulate themselves through painting through digital practice through performance through film you know all of them through ceramics like all sorts of different things and unless you have those mechanisms for capturing those more performative, those more ephemeral, those more digital moments. If you zoom out and you think about what that art history is going to look like in 50 years, 100 years, whatever, if you don't have those performative ephemeral moments, that practice doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And so it's in that sense, like what becomes really important is how you capture 
both the material and the immaterial kind of bits in order to be able to talk about a holistic kind of constellation of materialities within even one artist's work. That's super interesting. Um, I'd like to move um, into DAOs, if I may, because, um, well, you're a DAO, your, your gallery is a DAO, um, and I just wondered you're if you could, first of all, either see Keith or Seth um, explain to us what it means to be a DAO, um, and how does that relate specifically to community building? I'd say, I would say that a DAO, in, in essence, is a new way to organize people who are doing things, whether they're, you know, you're bringing together people with all different types of skill sets, uh, un unified with some sort of common goal. And the goal of Bright Moments is to educate, empower, and connect people across the world through non-fungible NFTs, um, yeah, exec going around the world, you know, with 10,000 NFTs. We'd like to leave a trail of all of these beautiful artwork experiences in addition to the NFTs from the DAO. And so that's, you know, that's the goal. We're, we're onboarding people every day. Um, we had, there's a, you know, our booth is right around the corner, X16. If you want to stop by, we're happy to speak later. <laughs> <You're onboarded. laughs> uh, Avi and myself and Jonathan, we've, we've been speaking, you know, all, all week so far. We're losing our voices because there's so much, there's so much to, to, to help give. And, you know, bring, we're bringing people in and we're giving, you know, the knowledge that we have. And it's a very new field even. I've, I've only been doing this type of, you know, engagement and NFTs for like less than a year. It's just, it's so new. It's so new. And so... If you start to get involved now, you are still very early in terms of where this is going. Everybody's going to have this digital sort of record that goes with them, uh, tied to the NFTs, and DAOs are an efficient means by which you can use NFTs to run organizations, and that's what we're doing at, at Bright Moments. So and I would, just, I would just add, Keith, it's a way of um, coordinating people um, around a common cause without central authority, right? And so to give you a, a tangible example, um, every, um, every person that holds one of our crypto citizens is by definition a member of the DAO. So there's no shares, um, there's no seats, it's NFTs. And if you own a crypto Venetian or a crypto New Yorker or soon a crypto Berliner, you have a, a, a full membership vote in the DAO and you can vote on chain um, on proposals. And so one of our proposals recently was okay, after Berlin, what city do we go to next? Where should we go as a DAO to mint our next collection of 1,000 crypto citizens? Should it be A, London, B, Paris, C, Dublin, um, uh, D, Lisbon, uh, or E, Amsterdam? And we put that to a vote. And we didn't know where we were going to go. Some of us um, voted on Lisbon. Some of us voted on London. Uh, some of us, you know, Keith has a reason to be in Amsterdam. Um, but we as a DAO voted on London. And so in July, we're all going to go to London to mint our next collection and also engage artists in London. And after that, there'll be a vote for where do we go in Latin America? And then where do we go in Asia? Um, and so it's a really, in and, and everything is transparent on chain. Um, and I imagine if Andy Warhol was alive, the factory would be organized as a DAO. Um, it's a really beautiful, um, again, sort of framework for aligning the interests of ownership, of collectors, of creators, and of audience um, in a common framework to make decisions without having some of the hierarchies of traditional uh, corporate, you know, corporate or uh, other kinds of institutions. I mean, do you think this could apply to the museum world, Rose? Do you think a museum could be a DAO? Yeah, I guess I guess a question that I have is is how is how and whether a DAO can have an like in the way that Seth just described that it's 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 kind of it's a sort of multiple choice poll, which is different to, for example, a kind of open space of decision making or a kind of democratic space of decision making. So somebody has come up with those five cities or however many it was and said, now you can all vote on these five cities and so in a, in some ways i think there are already structures within museums that that sort of have those kind of pockets of kind of let's say more kind of egalitarian decision making but but that's slightly different to the idea of collective decision making 
in a bigger sense, which, you know, really kind of starts with kind of like an open... So, I don't, yeah, I think, yes. Let me add one You're term heading, for you to respond to. You're heading down the right track. The, um, yeah. we, there's, a, there's a saying with DAOs um, called progressive decentralization. So I think what you bring up is, yeah, there's a, there is power dynamics at stake from the beginning because somebody or some group is building the DAO. It doesn't just happen automatically. The question is, how can those decisions start to move to the edges so in the future it's not a multiple choice, but the, the proposals that get voted on themselves yeah. um, mm. are, are coming out of the DAO? For, yeah, for example, we, we use different means of communication uh, online. If you're a DAO member, you can, you can say, hey, if, if we're talking about curation as part of you know, creating a museum, you can put forth a proposal. Should we acquire, as a, as a DAO or museum, should we acquire an incomplete control? Mm. And you can put that to a vote and a dialogue and a discussion, and then you can use your NFTs as voting mechanisms to then vote on that. And so this, this question of which is the next city, as Seth is talking about, the progressive decentralization, there's still an operating team right now as part of Bright Moments. People have to go you know, arrange the, find the sites, arrange the facilities. It's a, it's a hospitality business. We're working with curating artists. And so there's still some centralization required in, mm -hmm. in mobilizing and in moving you know, people on the ground. But in terms of c coming to decisions such as that, the DAO is a very powerful tool in progressively decentralizing and moving towards 10,000. We're about 3,000 NFTs into mm -hmm. 10,000. But as we go to each new city, we're bringing in new members in every single city. We're decentralizing, we're globalizing across the world. And we're going to have a broader uh, perspective on all these options. Mm -hmm. and, and, and yet you can, you can, you'll be able to do all those, all those types mm -hmm. of functions. And the optimist in me thinks it sounds brilliant, yes. and the pessimist in me thinks it sounds like the rule of the mob at yes, a <laughs> certain point. Yes, humans are fallible. <laughs> exactly. Governance is governance is difficult, right? Mm. It, governance is difficult in government and any any organization and structure. Uh, and there's and it, this is still this is an early experimental mm. stage, um, but we're going to see where it where it goes. And mm. and. Um, so and I, think, I yeah. think to take the museum point sort of seriously in that sense, it's also, it, it's manifestly true that museums are going through a kind of critical moment in terms of how they engage audiences. And part of that is to do with like, the, you know, the, the history of the, of the object in the sense of like, it used to be that I would go to a museum and the idea was I would stand in front of a painting and this object would teach me something. And I would be on my own in relationship to this painting and there's a kind of yeah, pedagogical kind of relationship. This object tells me something. And now there's very much more of a kind of like, actually a museum is a space of community. Actually a museum needs to be somewhere where, where there's a kind of much more of a sort of reciprocal relationship between the way that knowledge is produced and that needs to be more diverse and that needs to be more kind of exactly that kind of democratic in that, in that sense. And so I think exactly that, these kind of radical structures that look at how that could work and particularly from that kind of global perspective, become really interesting. Yeah, for sure. And I think one of the really sort of interesting applications for DAOs has been either to operate as an art fund, you know, to, to pull resources to buy expensive works of art. And I know you are launching, are you not, a, a DAO fund here? I'll, I'll ask you about that in a moment. Well, Seth, I think, is going to speak about that. But the other, the other problem to that is, is raising funds for future projects. So you're, you're sort of acting more as commissioning bodies um, and a way of sort of maybe crowdsourcing um, funds for future projects. And I'll ask you, Rose, perhaps how that might be applied to um, sort of performance and more experience-based experience works. Um, but perhaps, can we ask you about the, the, the DAO fund you're launching here, for, here first? Am I right in thinking that, yeah, that's, Seth? Yep. But before going into that, I just want to touch on, there are a number of organizations right now that are currently operating in a manner as a DAO performing these functions. There's Flamingo DAO, there's Fingerprints DAO, which, who's, a, who's a member here today. Um, there was Constitution DAO, which organized in three days, I think they raised over $40 million to try to buy a copy, one of the private mm -hmm. copies of the US Constitution. And there's these, these massive, massive scale, you know, broad organizational structures, which a lot of people you know, don't even know each other. And it creates this cascading effect. Uh, and it can be small, it can be large. It just, as long as there's a purpose, a DAO can potentially be used to organize you know, a, a group of people who either know each other, don't even know each other, to achieve that goal. Um, in terms of the the fund that we're, we're launching in, in the structure of a DAO, um, the Bright Moments Opportunity Fund, 
we recognize that there is a need for, there's, a, there's, a, there, there's two reasons. One is we as a DAO, we've acquired some of these artworks and they're held in our multi-sig wallet. And so we have an incomplete control, we have some reflections, we have a crypto punk, and it's a cleaner structure to have a, a separate vehicle to hold these and as, as let the DAO operate and perform its mission of onboarding people and have a separate, um, a separate structure for holding assets like this. And you're able to do that with DAOs and sub DAOs. So that's one function. The other function is a lot of, there is a learning curve and a lot of people you know, need, to, need help making that step. They don't know who to follow. They don't know what to acquire. Um, it's, it's sort of the, the expertise behind um, who, who to track in this you know, growing and evolving market. And we have access to obviously the, the top, top generative artists, top crypto artists, top artists who are doing NFT work. And uh, as a DAO, we have the ability to procure those works and invest in them. And so we are launching a fund that will be focused on that. And uh, Seth, you want to touch on anything else there? I think you hit the, um, the, the key messages. I think DAOs enable organizations to focus on one thing and do it very, very well um, and to sort of detangle um, decision making. And so I think what we've done with Bright Moments is to build an organization um, that effectively is selling tickets to, um, to minting experiences, right? And that's kind of our business model. And we've done that with the shows in New York. We do that with our crypto Berliners, with crypto Londoners, um, is this idea of um, selling tickets on chain and then people come to IRL minting experiences to create NFTs together. Um, along the way, um, we're uncovering so many interesting artists um, and projects uh, in each city we go to that warrant investment and, and represent new opportunities with new emerging artists. In the case of Berlin alone, uh, we're launching the Berlin Collection, and every night a different artist is dropping 100 new NFTs, including one of my favorites who is the father, the co-father of the processing language called, uh, his name is Casey Reyes. He's an amazing generative artist. Um, Jeff Davis, who I mentioned before. So we see these opportunities with artists and we thought, why don't we create a separate organization, a new DAO called the Opportunities DAO to give accredited investors uh, the opportunity of coming into an, an NFT fund that's totally flat. There's no management fees. There's no traditional um, you know, hedge fund or art fund structure. It's really um, a loose network of, of individuals who can coordinate around the, the goal of purchasing and investing in NFT art um, and collaboratively decide um, what projects to hold and what to invest in. Um, so it's a pure NFT DAO uh, along the lines of uh, Flamingo DAO and some of the other DAOs that Aaron Wright and Tribute Labs uh, have put together. And that's something that we're announcing here at Art Dubai. I know Jonathan's in the audience and has been helping to spearhead this. Um, but I think it's a good example of the way that these ecosystems work together uh, around tokens. So, Rose, I mean, do you think DAOs, how might, how, how might DAOs benefit sort of experimental projects which aren't supported by the traditional art market? I mean, if you look at the crowdfunding, commissioning body kind of model. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the answer, isn't it? Is exactly that, like, the, that it feels like that's a way of, of kind of, you know, amplifying that crowdfunding model that that also not only has a kind of financial sort of support structure but also somehow a kind of more sort of interactive conversation with like the the, the process and therefore the development of a practice and potentially in that sense also the distribution because I guess it, you know if you're thinking about something that has a kind of global network of people who are supporting it, then you might also be able to think about ways that things kind of circulate in more, let's say, ambitious ways. Um, because I think, obviously enough, what has happened kind of with a lot of those kind of crowdfunding things is, is that they tend to be very localised. So, so the network that they tend to um, uh, uh, kind of draw from is one that that is that is already somehow connected with the project. Let's say certainly kind of you know the one, like I find that I quite frequently get sent kind of you know fundraising requests from people that I already know, and then I also have to send out fundraising requests to people that already know me. And so this is in that sense a much bigger pool of people that it could potentially be kind of 
drawing on, which has really interesting implications, both for the scale of the ambition that you could think about things happening in, but also then for the way that those might circulate and have visibility in different kind of places across a period of time. Mm. Enormous sort of community building potential, it seems. Mm. So I just wanted to finish um, by asking you all, it's a bit of a crystal ball one, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's a bit biggie to all the panellists, but I mean, I wanted to ask each of you, what do you think, um, what elements of NFTs and DAOs that we've discussed might endure or might just disappear? I mean, and, and what parts might be beneficial for the, the mainstream art world? What will endure? Am I going first? Or? <laughs> that would be very <laughs> brave of you, um, if you would like to, yes, please. It, it's difficult. I mean, obviously, it's, it's always difficult to tell what's going to endure from such a new thing. I think one of the things that, like, that maybe we were touching on earlier that for me is really interesting is how some of these things are a kind of digital crypto kind of application of some ideas that have been around for a long time. So, so thinking about things like that history of conceptual practice and like the kind of Seth C. Glaub artist resale rights kind of documents that were, were born as a way of thinking about how an artist can not only benefit from the sale of their work the first time, but also potentially when it's resold or thinking about how they keep hold of certain types of kind of copyright and certain bits of kind of ownership over an idea, even as it circulates around. And that this is, this is in some respects, an updating of that that allows for it to actually be kind of enforced rather than a nice idea that you can choose whether or not you kind of like hold, uh, are held by. And I think, because I think that's kind of what happened with that Seth Seaglaub moment, it was a great idea, but nobody actually used it. But 60 years later, people still refer to it as being a, a, a kind of instrumentally interesting idea that never quite took off. It's a yeah. tough question. <laughs> it is. I, I, I uh, can't lie. I, I guess the, I would say it's everything you do on the blockchain technically will endure. So the as soon as you get involved in a DAO, you're going to create a digital record with whatever wallet you're using and interacting with that will endure forever. Now, what will happen to that organization in the future? It could split off into sub DAOs. It could, you know, it could, you know, the, the DAO could, you know, fade away and you could get involved with other DAOs. And, um, you know, that's the roadmap that we're going on and exploring. And when you're talking about, you know, the localization versus the globalization, as we go to all these new cities, we're creating new communities which potentially we would hope would continue to thrive on their own and be part of the more global bright moments organization but as well you know have the local berlin community and the you know the german bright moments community and maybe they'll focus on unique meetups they'll have their own events but mm -hmm. they'll also participate in the more the more broad um the broad uh the broad mission uh, and so it's we'll we'll see where we'll see what endures but it will all endure on the blockchain if it's an <laughs> nft basically there will be a permanent record yeah. Seth, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would say uh, two things. One is, um, and I think it's been there in art from, from the very beginning, is, is just the role of chance and, and, and randomness and surprise that um, can be institutionalized on the blockchain, right? That, that this, you know, in the same way that when Tyler Hobbs revealed his incomplete controls in New York, the first 25 of them on Thursday, December 9th, he had never seen them before. He had designed the algorithm, but he didn't see the outputs. He saw the outputs with the collectors who were seeing them for the first time, and that was planned. It was, you know, it was structured for months to create this moment where we were all surprised by the output. Now that goes back to happenings, it goes back to fluxes, but what's interesting here is it's, it's mathematically, socially determined to be that way in that moment of time. And I think the technology around the blockchain and NFTs will ironically create more and more interesting random occurrences, even though they're totally programmed. So that's one thing that I think will endure. And the other thing that I find really interesting is we're starting to see um, different tribes or different audiences of, of, of collector bases who each have their own tokens coming together in interesting ways. So in our case, you know, in Berlin, we're working with um, our own collection, but we're also partnering with artists like Justin Aversano of Twin Flames and his community from Quant. 
or Tom Sachs Rocket Factory, um, or FWB, which is another sort of um, DAO and, and um, kind of culturally oriented uh, membership organization. Um, but what happens is, is, okay, if you have one of their tokens, you can come to our event for free or for a discount. And if we have one of your rockets, we can do something over here um, you know, with your audience in that venue. And I think that's very interesting. It's sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, it's almost like each artist has their own Soho house. They have their own community of members um, that are able to experience things in relationship to other communities. I don't think we had that before, and I think that will endure. That's super interesting. Thank you, Seth. Um, we have just five minutes left, so I don't know if anyone has any questions. We can probably take a couple from the audience. Um, Please. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Uh, welcome. <laughs> this uh, new wonderful uh, culture very promising and so that's my first question how do we start how do we join so, so and, to and become... two things helping helping to uh, promote it and at the same time to be uh, part of it part of the that's that's a great question yeah, to become part of bright moments as, as a DAO member you just have to hold one of our crypto citizens which is one of our nfts it's a crypto new yorker crypto venetian crypto berliner and that's it, if you're, you're part of the DAO by holding one of our NFTs. And so the distribution model in every single city we go to, uh, where there's a thousand of them that we distribute, a third of them are sold to help finance the city, a third of them are given away probabilistically to the existing base of crypto citizens, and so that's an on-chain probabilistic model, it's a statistical uh, probability of getting one if you have one. And then the, the third way is, if you're from that city, we reserve a third to onboard new people from that city. and so. In Berlin, we're seeking to onboard 334 local Berliners as part of our you know, education and outreach and activation of the community. And so that's how we, we at Bright Moments operate. You can go to OpenSea and buy a crypto citizen. Yeah, you can go on OpenSea. So if you wanted to join right now, you could go on OpenSea, which is the, the primary trading platform for NFTs. It's an op, you know, a Web3 based. You, link, you need a digital wallet, a MetaMask with Ethereum. And, there's just a secondary market, and you can just acquire an NFT. You can join the DAO right now if there's one for sale. You can just go on and click. And you, just, you just need to get on, you need to get on board. Well, Stop uh, by our booth. We'll talk to you later. There yeah. you go. <laughs> Anyone else? Please. I think there's a mic coming to you. I've got a whole bunch of questions. So I'm going to find you. While the mic's heading over, who holds an NFT currently? I just got curious about the audience. Who has an NFT? That's a good question. Who's in a DAO currently of, of those? So it looks like about a third of the NFT holders or half are in, in the DAO from this room. Go ahead, thanks, just curious. <laughs> no, it's a good question. Uh, I just had a question coming back to some of the points you guys touched on already. Um, progressive decentralization, um, leading into what Ruth had said, uh, sorry, it, Rose, sorry. Um, who organizes the proposals inside your DAO? Um, and, and coming to that is, Moving away from the typical hierarchy of organization into a kind of uh, a community based uh, one vote one person for, for simplistic terms um, at the moment you guys are kind of determining the proposals a B C D uh, in, in essence everybody effectively has a vote and is, has an ability to create their own proposal I want to do this today um, how is that being managed and how will it be managed potentially in the future where you know you've opened up your organization to thousands of people. Um, and everybody collectively gets their own say in, in how to run it. That's a great question. That's part, of the, that's part of the proposal mechanism. For example, we just launched a vote the other day, closing Monday. So of the third that we're distributing in terms of giving away for Berlin, there were seven tokens that went unclaimed. And so we as a DAO had to figure out how are we going to distribute those seven tokens that are for the existing crypto citizens. And we are voting on that right now. We had a proposal open, you know, how do we get rid of these tokens? You know, how do we distribute these tokens? Uh, for maybe it was open for two or three weeks. We had, an, we had uh, five total proposals, and now we're voting on that right now, and the results will be out on Monday. So that, that's a great question there. Uh, in terms of further, I don't know, Seth, do I have anything to add on that point? I, no, I, I think, you know, I think, again, I think we can all hide behind the notion of progressive decentralization, but that doesn't really give teeth to what you're saying. I think there's a time frame for DAOs to move from a founding team or a founding vision to truly becoming decentralized. I think in our case, 
Um, our roadmap um, is over the next 18, 24 months, by the end of next year, we want to mint 10,000 crypto citizens. You know, we need to get from, you know, Berlin to London, maybe it's Mexico City, maybe next year it's Seoul, Tokyo, Rio, Venice, Italy. I don't, I don't know where all the cities are going to be. The DAO is going to decide. But after that, I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm one of the founders. But the, the beauty here is to can we get to a point over the next 18 months where as a more decentralized DAO, we as an organization can make a decision for what we want to do next. And that is open-ended. That is not a multiple choice question. Um, most companies will tell you their 10 year plan. We're not a company, you know, we're a project, you know, and back hearkening back to some of the avant-garde arts organizations like Andy Warhol's factory. Um, we're going to figure out in 18 months, what makes sense as a DAO. We're going to have a lot of options. I think we're going to have a really invested, engaged community of many people that we haven't met yet. And hopefully together we'll decide what to decide on. We have one minute left, so one last quick question. question. Yeah. Uh, the best anal analogy for a DAO would be probably in real life is a VC fund or a venture capital fund uh, as a project in, uh, uh, project in progress. So would that be the best analogy? And the second question, how would you pay your, the bills for the, the fees, the costs for running a DAO? Seth, you want to take that or you want me to take that? <laughs> Let me go ahead and start. Yeah. I, I don't think the best analogy is a VC fund, but okay. It depends, <laughs> on, it depends on the purpose of the DAO, of course, what, what, your, yeah. what, your, what your goal is, right? So if it's, an, it's a fund that's making investments, then you could potentially equate it to a VC. Sure. If it's an organization that ha is trying to accomplish a mission, uh, then that's, that would be a different purpose. So so it, depend, it depends on what the, the mission of the, of the DAO and organization is. Well, on that note, I think it just leaves me to thank my panellists, Rose, Keith and Seth. Thank you so much for joining at 2.30 in the morning. Thank you. Um, and thanks to everyone <laughs> here. That was brave. I'll go back to bed. <laughs> well done. Thank you.